and welcome back to Navigating Adulthood and IDD. I am your host, Bonnie Haupt, and today I'm doing a solo episode about getting back in person with adults with IDD in music groups and music therapy specifically. So first of all, happy Spooktober. I hope everyone's having a great transition into fall. In Colorado, it's starting to get cooler and the leaves are definitely changing, and I love this time of year, consuming many pumpkin drinks and cozying up with tea and just really enjoying the weather. And so I have started going back in person with day programs more recently, including a program I hadn't been to since before the pandemic. We had to pause and I got to come back for the first time this last week and I've been doing another day program. And so for some backstory, when the pandemic kind of hit, the day programs I had been working with, we had to take a pause both to kind of figure out like, what are we doing? What about funding? What's the safest? And so we paused, you know, for well over a year. And as many caseloads for therapists out there, you know, some clients kind of, we lost to the pandemic and some we stayed in touch. I got the opportunity to do a couple of online groups over the pandemic, but nothing in person until about September this year. I finally got to be back in person with adults with IDD, um, back in this group work that I enjoy a lot because I've been doing mostly individual sessions with, children's and, with children and adults with disabilities online for over a year and then starting to get back in person or I also continue to offer telehealth. And so now that I'm back in person with groups, Today, I wanna to give you five tips for working in person with adults with IDD, with kind of the theme of getting back to working in person, but also just, you know, what are things to consider when working with a group with adults with IDD? So there'll definitely be a music therapy spin to this, but I hope that um, this you could see where the overlap with other professions. We'll discuss that as well so that we can get this to be as beneficial as possible with the five tips on getting back in person with adults with IDD. So before we dive in, it's kind of why I went on my spooktober little rant a little bit is that I've also started to get, get to use Halloween and fall activities in these groups as well. So I might share a couple in the tips today, but th that's been one part that's been fun getting back in person is kind of the seasonal time of the year and um, almost leaning into that transitional time of the year too. So tip number one is related to health protocols, COVID protocols to keep everyone safe. This is definitely something that's different than pre-pandemic life with some overlap of things that I had done before. So it's really like navigating equipment. Can you reduce equipment? Making sure it's wiped down afterwards, which I did before the pandemic too. Mask wearing, distancing if possible, and considering all of those aspects when setting up the room as new environmental challenges that are different than before the pandemic. But fortunately with my individual work, a lot of that can be applied to a group. The biggest thing I think is equipment. And tip number one is can everyone have their own instrument? So I have a bunch of bucket drums, as many people might know who listen. And because I have many bucket drums, that's been really helpful in these groups where everyone can have their own bucket drum and then I can sanitize it after, but there's not, uh, you can decrease the instrument sharing when, when needed to. Luckily with adults with IDD, and in many cases, most people in the room are vaccinated. I find working with children is harder right now as there's no vaccine as uh, for children when this was recorded. So that can help, but I think we can still do our due diligence of, of being really intentional when there is instrument sharing, when there's not, allowing there to be an option to not instrument if if possible, and to kind of keep that in like very intentional uh, of how, how much instrument sharing is there in a session. Because I think before the pandemic, it wasn't something I ever considered or thought of. It was just like instruments out, let's, you know, let's, let's make some music. And now it's being very intentional on who has what instrument, is it, like, is everything sanitized? So tip number one, see if everyone can have their own instrument. And so if you're in another profession, this could be any material you're working with, say you're drawing, can everyone have their own set of colored pencils, you know, and et cetera. Just can everyone kind of have their own thing and reduce that sharing when when possible, or just overall thinking about reducing sharing to do our to do our due diligence when possible. 
So another thing that I've noticed going back in person with, with adults with IDD specifically, it's been really hard. <laughs> it's been really hard the, through the, you know, pandemic still going on. It's been hard since the pandemic started. And while it's so nice to be back in person and to bring music and to bring this joy in person, I can feel a lot of the pain of, of the adults that I'm working with and can relate to some of it too with that pandemic. It's been a hard time. So I really think there's an emotional component we need to focus on right now in our groups with adults with IDD. So tip number two is to bring any kind of mindfulness, yoga, or other emotional expression activities, or allow space for listening and being there with the client. So this last week in a group, I did Halloween yoga. I had a, a bingo card we did as a group and we made different shapes. So like a spider web, we were kind of in a big power pose stretching out and everyone was kind of able to express themselves in their own way because there wasn't one right way to make the pose it was like oh how would you make a spider web and and really stretching so there's two components here where we were doing self-expression which is great for emotional emotional self-expression too and then stretching and connecting with our bodies and getting grounded getting regulated when the wind times are kind of harder and so i think that was a great activity for that as well and I also think with tip number two, with, with bringing in these different intentional activities to make sure we can address people's emotions is songwriting, I think, can be a very useful activity to work on this skill as well. So if you're not a music therapist, you know, you could still use songwriting in a session or think about using some kind of grounding, yoga, emotional expression, listening to people and thanking them for sharing their experiences and just kind of allowing space for that emotional awareness and and discussion and exploration and expression because there's a lot of feelings right now understandably and i think i've i've seen that right away with working with my adults with idd it's like oh, okay it's been it's been tough how can we address it how can we cope how can we build resilience as a community together so tip number three for working with adults with IDD in-person groups is to talk to them like adults, treat them like adults. And this is one that's not really pandemic related. It's just something I'm reminded of in my work and I try to be really conscious of when I'm talking to someone to remember like this is an adult. And I think one, one piece of my work that can make that more difficult is I do work with children and adults and I try to talk to everyone as a person, but I think there's still bias and society bias that I have to really uh, keep reflecting after sessions of how I interacted with people. Did I treat them like an adult? Did I respect them? And um, to continue to bring that in. So tip number three related to this is to bring in their preferred music. So I wrote a song called Fall Y'all and did a songwriting to it um, and it was a lot of fun. And I think, I, you know, I think the adults in the group enjoyed naming fall things and then we played along to it and it was it was fine and this is a song that i've tried to written that has more of an adult feeling to it with the accompaniment but i also kind of reflected afterwards and i'm thinking next time i go to this group i want to make sure i incorporate maybe more songs that they know and that are um, more well known to just really make sure i'm respecting their pr preferred music and helping with their engagement in the session because i also did thriller and i think that was a lot of fun because it's a kind of a Halloween song that we all know and can enjoy. So tip number three is to bring in that preferred music. Treat the adults like adults that you're working with. I and mean, when developing activities, coming in with that mindset of, of it being for adults and, and to really respect that. And another kind of general thing I like to do with my groups, both pre and, and during pandemic, is um, encouraging everyone to participate and making sure everyone has an opportunity to participate at some point. So tip number four is have different ways to adapt each activity that you're doing. So an example of this is with songwriting, for example, where I had the adults in my group naming different fall things they liked. Some were able to you know, immediately verbally think of something and communicate that to me. And for other clients, it appeared to be more difficult. So I had some visuals where they could pick out different choices of different fall things so that everybody could pick something. And on our final product, 
everyone had chosen something for the song and and you can kind of adapt in that way having visual options having options between having a word bank having those ideas so that everyone can participate in going around and getting everyone's feedback if you're doing an instrument play seeing if you can take a moment to work with one client who might need a little more support or even you know a physical adaptation of moving an instrument and really allowing that space to encourage not only encourage everyone to participate but to make things accessible for everyone to participate so that's tip number four and you know i think just reflecting music in person definitely has a certain spark to it that can't be denied although i have enjoyed and still enjoy my telehealth sessions i think the technology can get in the way and i think we truly can synchronize a little more in person when especially with like rhythm drumming activities so there's something that can't be denied about in-person music although i you know i do think telehealth is beneficial and in its own way i i really think both in person and telehealth it's like oh there's something here for kind of in, in different ways for for both vehicles of therapy of music therapy of music groups but one thing i've really enjoyed in person is that synchronization that we can do in person with with drumming with rhythms and you know research has shown that drumming can improve our mental health and that we can synchronize in person with other people and connect with them and build community and decrease symptoms of anxiety and stress, specifically in group drumming that's been found. So I've really brought drumming into my in-person groups as we're starting to come back together. So my last tip, tip number five, is to be present. And I think, you know, this is one thing I've really tried to work on throughout the pandemic, even when I started online, because you get kind of thrown into something new and we can get really focused on, oh, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. But it's really working on sometimes just being with the, our clients or the people we work with that can they can benefit from that they can benefit from us listening to them and connecting in the moment we don't always have to be doing something or presenting music but that we can pause in our sessions and really be with the person and really respond to what they're doing versus sticking to our plan so really being present i think is probably the most important tip up that will help kind of make all of these go together so those are my five tips for working back in person. It's been really surreal this week returning to the the one group. I even talked to members in the group where I was like, the last time I was here was the first week of March 2020, you know, and, and to kind of sit in that and talk to each other about that and, and to celebrate like, hey, I'm back and now we can make music together and we can be in community and use music as a positive coping skill and yeah there, there's a lot to celebrate with that and so that was an, a cool reflection so what's it been like for you especially with group work have you been in person the whole time did you have to pause do you have you are you on telehealth have you been on telehealth the whole time and has anything changed with your group work recently please feel free to email me at bonnie at rhythmicrootsmusictherapy.org with any kind of feedback or comment on social media I'd love to hear how how our group's going for you. It's it's weird being back, but like a good a good weird. It's like it's it's familiar and yet there's things that are different because of COVID. And it, but it's familiar and we're making music together. And and it's still fun. So very surreal, I think it's maybe a good word to kind of put with it. But that, that's getting back, getting back in person. So my tips in order. Can everyone have their own instrument or material? Bring mindfulness, yoga, or other emotional expression activities. Number three, bring their preferred music. Number four, have different ways to adapt each activity. And number five, be present. Awesome. And for the rest of our, this kind of solo episode this month, I want to acknowledge that October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And I have been so grateful and um, fortunate to have some really awesome previous guests on the podcast who have discussed employment and employment opportunities. And I want to highlight those episodes. They'll be in the link below, as well as some other things mentioned in this episode. But here are some sound bits too. First, we'll hear from Brent and Jenny Anderson from episode four. Then we'll hear from Lauren Burgess and Robbie Cheney from Dirt Coffee, episode eight. And we'll end with a clip from my interview of Danny Combs with Teaching the Autism Community Trades Tact in episode 13. Oh, and I forgot to say, Jenny 
Anderson and Brent Anderson are from Celebrate EDU. So all these episodes have themes of employment and we'll hear those clips in that order. There needs to be a more diverse set of opportunities and not just sticking to certain categories and that have historically been allotted for people with disabilities to work. The term that's been used is the five F's over the years. I don't know if you've heard of that kind of terminology. The five F's used to stand for, kind of still stand for uh, food. So a lot of like grocery stores, fast food, flowers, so guard filth, janitorial work, folding. So working at a thrift store and folding clothes and filing, so admin work. And those were just the categories that were often just allotted for. Those are the only available jobs. So right. I think that there's there's so many more opportunities in our communities than just those five Fs. And those five Fs can really fit for certain people. And I think that's wonderful if someone wants to fit there and that's what their interest is and that's what their skill set is. That's wonderful. But I think just opening more opportunities and not kind of constraining our minds to thinking those are what people with disabilities are capable of. I can tell you have worked with hundreds of students and they all, the varying interests, the artistic talent, the technology skills, the, it varies from person to person, just like everyone else. And I think we're, we're trying to fit people into a box that should not exist. So right. just not having that preconceived notion of what people can do instead, just meeting them and understanding where, where they are as a, as an individual. That's kind right. of something both our businesses try to promote, that they can do more than what people typically think they can do. That's what my business promotes, and that's what Celebrate EDU promotes, that there are many more opportunities than people think, and they just have to figure out a way to do those things. <laughs> some resources that really aren't tapped into in most communities are small businesses where you could maybe intern or work part-time. You know, they might not have the, the, the capacity to hire on a bunch of people to work there, but, you know, a small bike repair shop, if that's something you're interested in, like those are, those are things that are part and at the heart of every single community are these small businesses. I think a lot of people think it's scary to hire someone with a disability. They don't know how to, they don't know what supports are needed. And I think there's a lot of education and support the disability community could give to these businesses to help them better understand what they can do. And then I also think that I can just say from years of doing this, that self-employment is looked at as like not really an option for people with disabilities. Kind of like the last resort, oh, they couldn't get a job, so they will be self-employed or they couldn't succeed at a job, so that will be their last resort, which I just can't wrap my head around because it should, you know, the statistics show that individuals with disabilities are actually two times more likely to be self-employed than the general population because it has a lot of what we've been talking about, the accommodations and right. that you can build self-employment don't exist in a traditional work environment unless it's a really special one. And so I think that instead of looking at it as, oh, I guess they'll pursue that, it should be something that isn't included as an option from the very beginning. You know, you could pursue competitive integrative employment, you could pursue self-employment, and those are options available to you, and it's not looked back, looked at as a secondary option. Well, I would say one thing that they can do is try not to judge people because they have a disability because so because if people have like a mental disability I tend to find that people say oh they're not really that smart they can't really do very much because they don't have the mind to do so or if they're physically disabled because of their physical disability they therefore they can't physically do something and like they always need help or they can never do anything on their own but the truth is they can do things on their own. It takes effort to do so and time to do it. It's just, you have to make the effort to make it work and not just, and like, don't judge them by what they, what do you think, what you, what people think they can do, because that's kind of a stereotypical way of thinking in my view, because like when people first heard hear my presentation they often have a lot of hope for their if their parents they have a lot of hope for their own kids because they seen what I can do and therefore they see me as like a role model for something 
for their own kid to do it. They just have to make the effort to do so. <laughs> so, so my view is like employer, your employees and employers and employees shouldn't judge people with disabilities based on just their disability because that's kind of being very judgmental in my view, so. <laughs> What strengths do I bring to bring to work? I learn from a few minor mistakes, and I learn it quickly. I I like to keep myself detained at all times, making sure everything's where it needs to be neatly. And I also remind some of my other coworkers the same things. And I think it's just basically trying to be patient with customers who are in a bit of a rush or, or such and they're all and they're always patient with me even when I tell them to and as long as I keep my self focused I'm I'm good to go yeah I think Robbie's story is a great example and you can probably gather that he is really humble and doesn't doesn't brag about all of the things that he brings to the table. And so, for example, Robbie sharing that, you know, he was working somewhere else and that we were finally ready to open up our doors and offered him the management position. And back when we were just starting, we knew that we needed baristas and we knew that we needed managers and we knew who we wanted those managers to be and who those baristas to be. But, but we didn't know much more than that. Running an actual brick and mortar versus a mobile coffee truck is night and day different. So it was actually Robbie who really created and helped us to create the back of house manager position because that position did not create before or did not exist before Robbie. And that was created because we saw Robbie was super meticulous when it came to anything food prep related and inventory related. We would learn, you know, we would add a brand new panini to our menu and the vendor would teach us how to make sure to cook it correctly and serve it correctly and make sure that it's all up to par. And Robbie was the one that really helped us hone in on that and say, and, and catch us too and say, oh, actually it's, I found that this is a better way to do that. And let's make sure we're all doing it the same way. And that consistency is really important. And then that's when we kind of realized, holy moly, Robbie is bringing such a unique strength to the team and making sure that everything we do is super consistent and really high quality. And so we, we gave him the title of back of house manager with his help to create it because of those specific strengths that he brings and he alone brings and is, you know, every week at our or every other week at our management meetings, he's the one that's giving us updates about where our inventory is at and any new processes with regards to how we're prepping the foods and, and preparing the food. So I think that's, that's important because all of our employees bring a unique skill or strength to the table. And something that I think DIRT has been really great at is recognizing and being able to suss out what those unique strengths are and what each individual brings to the table and then cultivating a position around that. There's this idea out in the world that employers just don't know how to employ people with disabilities and it's you know how do we manage that or um, how do we put these modifications in place but it's really it's it's not much different than hiring anybody else and honestly if if Robbie wasn't who he was uh, we probably wouldn't have a back of the house manager and would still be kind of uh, a duck underwater where it's like calm and cool up above, but then the kicking feet down below water and still trying to figure out what, what these systems and processes look like. So we're kind of diversified in our programming. So we use trades and technical skills as kind of vessels for work ethic towards getting a job. That's kind of our end goal. So 90% of the autism community is un or underemployed. It's the highest under or unemployed group in the country, which is just insane to think about the fact that, you know, CDC reports think it's one in 52 kiddos with autism or young adults with autism. Some states are higher. So it's, it's a large part of our poor population. I think 90% of them end up unemployed is just wildly insane, I think. 
So we're using these skills to try to break that. We just don't find that acceptable in any, any stretch of the imagination. So we have a bunch of camps and workshops and one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons that we do nights and weekends. And the idea for those individuals coming to that starts as young as five. And obviously we're not putting a five-year-old on a welding torch or under an engine, but we have a bunch of different trades, everything from textiles to instrument making to flying drones to audio engineering, a bunch of different things. And then moving that up, that experience to get them excited and exposed to the trades. And then when they get to the age that they are in the transition age, then we have what we call our career tracks program. And it acts as just that, a transition program for taking individuals that are of working age and transitioning them from a traditional high school type program into the actual workforce. And that one's been very successful. I mean, we have an over 80% job placement rate. I mean, we're pretty much a 180 from every other program in the state. So it's exciting. We, we want to see what their passion is and what their strengths are. I mean, we're a strengths-based program. Traditionally, a lot of autism programs are deficit-based programs where they tend to look at what needs to be fixed, where we look at it as, okay, what is this person's strength? What do they excel out? How can we build upon that so that they are successful in their career, in their life? I'm not saying that we are oblivious to those things that need to be perhaps strengthened, but we're not focusing on those, you know, deficits. We're focusing on the strengths and then kind of naturally when you empower somebody based upon their strengths, then a lot of times those things that, you know, traditional autism programs would look at as deficits are naturally kind of supported. That being said, because of that, we found so many success stories with that. Right now there's a three-year longitudinal study that Children's Hospital is doing on us because our kind of, and it's very subtle, the way that we're looking at things based upon those strengths is very counter to the way a lot of our culture currently looks at the world and what we need to do. All right. Thank you so much for listening today and to our October podcast about working in in-person groups with adults with IDD, highlighting these awesome episodes about employment for um, disabled individuals. If you like this episode, please share it with somebody, like us on iTunes, rate us on iTunes, Share it with somebody you think would like it and just keep continuing to listen. Other ways to support the podcast include becoming a Patreon patron for $5 a month. You get ad-free episodes one week early, access to a monthly music therapy session breakdown plan, and access to our Facebook community, as well as some other resources I make. For example, I just created an ebook with Christine Devereaux of Spectrum Yoga. It's called Music and Mudras. You can listen to more about that in our last episode, which I'll link below in the description. And in our ebook, we go over ways you can use hand, uh, hand yoga poses and music together in these sensory-rich activities that are engaging and have so many benefits as laid out in our book. So check that out if you want more information. And if you're a patron, sometimes I post our, we, we create extra resources ongoing with the ebook as just kind of an extra way to keep giving back and to keep creating. And if you're a patron, you have access to some of these activities as well. I just posted one the other day called On Halloween Night, which is one of our extra mudra resources. So check it out at patreon.com backslash navigating adulthood and IDD if you're interested or check out the description for more information on all topics in this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I will catch you next time. This podcast is by Rhythmic Roots Music Services, LLC with content and music by Bonnie Haupt. Transcriptions are made by my favorite little sister, Emma Haupt. Thanks for listening.